Hello, everybody, and welcome to the From Poverty to Progress channel, the channel that is devoted to promoting an awareness and understanding of human progress. My name is Michael Magoon. I am the author of the From Poverty to Progress book series. The first book in this series is called From Poverty to Progress, where I explain the origins and causes of modern human progress. The second book, Promoting Progress, will be available in the spring of 2023, where I build on those ideas to argue for a new policy agenda for keeping progress going. Stay tuned to the end of this video for a free book giveaway. Today I'm going to continue my series on ideologies. Now, it might not seem immediately obvious why ideology is related to the topic of progress, but I think it is. I believe that ideologies are the greatest threat to world progress, particularly in wealthy Western nations. If you haven't seen my previous video on why ideologies threaten progress, you should probably watch it first before this video. First, I want to go over what I believe are the key differences between the ideological left and the ideological right. The left believes that people of good intentions should use the power of government to create a more just society. The right believes that our society is already the best possible outcome given the constraints of human nature, and any sudden changes are likely to have negative consequences on society. Today, I'm going to focus on Today I'm going to focus on what I believe is the key question. Where do ideologies come from? Ironically, there's been very little research on this immensely important topic. I received a PhD in political science and public policy from Brown University, and during that time we almost never talked about ideologies and where they come from. Now if you were to ask a typical person on the street, what are some of the most important things that influence politics and government, I'm sure many people would say ideologies. But yet, the academic research on the topic is very, and ironically, most of the research that does exist comes not from political science, but it actually comes from psychology. The field of political science has very little to say about where ideologies actually come from. In other words, I would say it as what parts of the human brain are activated by ideologies and how are those ideologies formed. To understand the role of ideology in modern society, I think we need to look backwards into time and look at the role of religion. In the past, traditional religions, such as Christianity, Judaism, and Hinduism, determine what is moral and immoral. They explain the unexplainable, they give meaning to people's lives, they create a shared identity with others, and they project an image of morality to others within their group to ease cooperation. Ideology, particularly left-wing ideology, is increasingly replacing religion among educated people in Western nations, particularly in terms of what determines what's moral and immoral, and the role of government and society is being determined by ideology, not by traditional religion. And ideology shifts the focus from the moral actions required of individual believers, which is what religions are typically based on, to what government should do in order to create a better society. Most religions clearly differentiate between the sphere of governance and morality. Ideologies, however, lack that constraint. And to a large extent because of that, the scope of ideology appears to be constantly expanding into spheres that were previously thought to have nothing to do with ideology at all, including the weather, i.e. climate change, garbage, garbage collection, for example, recycling, and what kind of products should be purchased by people is increasingly determined by ideology, not just individual choice or common sense. Let's get back to the original question. Where do ideologies come from? I think most people, when they think about ideologies, tend to think of in what I would call a rational model. Now, it's important to remember that there are no social scientists that I know of that believe in this rational model, but I think if you were to talk to an everyday person on the street, they would come to a conclusion about where ideologies come from of something that go along these lines. First of all, persons, a, a specific person, researches the issues. Then they decide where they stand on each issue. They then compare the sum of their views to all the existing ideologies within their society. Then they choose the one that most closely fits with their beliefs. The voter 
then votes for the party or the candidate based on which comes closest to what they believe. And finally, they update their stance as the facts and the specific candidates change. So that all seems pretty reasonable. I think a lot of people would say that's how people make choices on ideology. But I think there's strong reason to believe that this is all completely incorrect. First of all, there is no tendency to converge on a correct ideology. It is not at all clear that ideologies progress towards greater understanding of reality, as does science, technology, engineering, and human material progress. All of these involved over time human beings acquiring a greater and greater understanding of reality and getting a more close approximation of reality. For example, in science, scientists gradually learn over time what reality is like and build scientific theory based on that understanding. I think it's pretty clear that over time we have progressed in our understanding of the natural world. The same with technology and engineering. We know better how to transform reality for our own benefits than we did in the past. And the result of that is human material progress. Ideology is nothing like that. In fact, ideology tends to much more closely resemble things such as art and fashion, which are clearly based on non-rational impulses that change rapidly over time. And there's no clear progress towards greater understanding. Second, popular support for ideologies vary greatly over time and between cultures. If it was totally based on rationality, we would not expect this. There are also great variations within cultures by region and demographic group. If ideology were largely based on rationality, this would not be true. Now, if we were talking about this, say, 50, 60 years ago, a lot of people would say, well, it's obviously economic self-interest. Economic self-interest determines voting behavior and ideology. In other words, the poor and the working class vote for ideologies of the left because it benefits them by increasing the role of government in redistributing wealth and income and creating social policies. People, upper income voters, on the other hand, vote for parties of the right because they don't want to be taxed in order to spend for those programs. But the problem is, over the last 50, 60 years, there's been a clear trend in the opposite direction. Today, in Western world, upper income voters now tend to vote for the left, which will increase their own taxes and create social policies that do not benefit themselves in any way. And working class voters now tend to vote for the right, which is less likely to increase social spending that will benefit them. So clearly, economic self-interest alone cannot explain ideology and voting behavior. Maybe it once did, but it doesn't today. Also, it's very clear that all democratic societies have political parties that fit clearly into either the left or the right. Many people think of political parties along a spectrum where you have the far left, the far right, the center left, and the center right all neatly organized into a group. Now, it's not a perfect fit, but I certainly think most parties fit into this left-right spectrum. Another interesting fact that I hear almost no one commenting on is that there are almost no large political parties that are in the center. Generally, the largest two political parties are almost exclusively either on the left or on the right. Centrist parties, such as they exist, are typically very small. Most of you human behavior fits pretty nicely on what you can call a bell curve or a normal curve, where the vast majority of the people are in the middle, and then there's few outliers on the extremes. But that's the exact opposite of what we see in, uh, in parties and ideology. Most political parties are clearly on the left and the right, and there's very few parties in the center. This is exactly the opposite of what one would expect. Finally, and this is the most difficult thing to explain for our, the rational model, is voting behavior is closely tied to genetics. Now, I know a lot of people are very afraid to talk about genetics and its impact on human behavior, but I think we need to get over that taboo because it's extremely important. We know from analysis of twin studies that 40 to 60 percent of the variation in voting behavior is explained by genes. Yes, there is some impact of parenting, of life choices, and culture, but genes are by far the biggest impact. 40-60% of the variation is a monstrous amount of variation compared to other factors. Typically in social science, you get 1 or 2 or 5 to 10% of the variation explained by one variable. But when you add in genes, 
then you get closer to 40 to 60 percent. This inconvenient fact shows why the rational model does not work. So we're left back with our original question. Where does ideology come from? Obviously, the rational model doesn't help us very much, and nor does political science. I believe we need to look to psychology for better answers of this question. One of the most important books over the last few generations in the area of psychology is Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. Daniel Kahneman believes that the human brain is divided into two systems. System one, which he calls thinking fast, is essentially the non-rational part of the human brain. System two, or th which is thinking slow, is the rational part of human brain. Now, many people believe that human beings are dominated by the rational side, and that's what sets us off from other animals. But in fact, psychologists learn more and more that it is the non-rational side of the human brain that dominates in most areas. So let's learn a little bit more about system one, which is the thinking fast part. First of all, it operates automatically without us even perceiving it. It operates very quickly with little or no effort. There's no sense of voluntary control and it requires little energy. Most importantly, it's the most commonly used type of thinking of the human brain. And it's important to point out that system one is not irrational. It is non-rational. In other words, that has nothing to do with rationality. Sometimes it overlaps with rational decision-making in its outcomes. More often than not, it does not. System two, on the other hand, is thinking slow. This requires effortful mental activities, it takes a long time to achieve results, requires large amounts of energy, makes deliberate choices, and is capable of solving complex problems. But, and this is the most important point, it's only used when essential. This system two, part of the brain is essentially the rational part of the human brain. It's very important. It's probably more important than any other species, but it's still not the dominant way that human beings think. So I'm not going to go into much more detail about Daniel Kahneman's theories, but I think there are a few key takeaways that I think we should all get from it. One is that the goals of human beings are determined by system one. When humans can achieve these goals easily in the real world, their thinking stays within system one. It is only when they cannot achieve those goals in the real world that humans reluctantly shift to using system two. It's also important to understand that non-rational is not bad. A lot of people tend to think rational is good and non-rational is bad. That's not true at all. Here are some things that are non-rational, which I think all of us would agree are very good things. Love, friendship, sense of duty, Honesty, humility, compassion, responsibility, kindness, and I could go on and on. There are so many things that are fundamentally good about humanity that is not rational. At the same time, rationality is not always good. There is a specific type of human being called a sociopath that completely lacks in compassion for other people and makes very rational decisions that are at the expense of other people. A sociopath can be extremely rational but they can also be horribly destructive of others. So get rid of this idea that rationality is always good and non-rationality is always bad, because it's not true. I think to better understand where ideology comes from, we need to get into a little bit about how human beings learn. Most human problems involve actions with clear feedback. Here I'm gonna use the example of being hungry and you're a baby who cannot effectively communicate with their parents. System one will tell the baby, I am hungry. That is based on instinct. All human beings have the instinct to eat in order to survive. Then the body reacts. Because they can't speak, the infant might yell and scream and make gestures. They're hoping that this reaction will cause a change in the real world. Because the baby does, cannot make that cannot feed themselves, they have to hope that mom or dad or the babysitter will do the right thing. If System 1 gets the results that are wanted by System 1, then the body keeps doing the same thing. If you get bad results, well, like let's say mama tries to put baby to sleep. Baby yells louder because baby doesn't want to go to sleep. Baby is hungry. Now mama realizes, oh, baby is not sleepy. Maybe baby is hungry. So let's feed baby. So eventually the baby 
learns that certain behaviors will trigger the right response from mom or dad, and that will become a habit. That is system one thinking, and that dominates human behavior. But there are many things that are just too complex for system one to work. Human beings evolved to be hunter-gatherers in the African savanna. We did not evolve for modern society. So much of what system one teaches us is not useful. We need to resort to system two for more challenging skills. Here I'll, here I'll use the example of learning to drive. Now maybe system one will decide, hey, you need to learn how to drive. Maybe the reason is you want autonomy for yourself. Maybe you don't get along well with your parents and you want to have some kind of independence for them. Maybe you want status from your peers of being the first person among all your friends to be able to drive. System one then tells the body what to do. The body reacts. You need to figure out how to drive. System one says, do this. Your body reacts. The car does something completely different. System two realizes, uh-oh, this is not going to work. I'm going to have to take over now. I'm going to have to, well, hopefully, listen to the driving instructor because that person knows far more. That driving instructor will tell me what to do. I'll turn the steering wheel a little bit in this direction and see what happens. Oh, it's turning the car to the right. I'll do a little bit more. And, well, wait a minute. I want to turn to the left now. Well, maybe if I turn the steering wheel to the opposite direction, I'll get the desired results. But that's how System 2 works. It thinks through the problem. It constructs a reasonable hypothesis, then asks the body to do something and looks at the results in the real world, then changes those instructions to the body based on those results. Over time, you gradually learn how to drive. And what's interesting is, over time, you can learn how to drive without even using System 2. Most adults who have been driving for decades can drive without even thinking about it. They can drive while doing other things, although that's definitely not advised. But the driving becomes instinctive as though it's part of System 1 because you've done it so many times. It's become a habit. So what helps that learning process? Well, you need rapid feedback from the real world. A better course of action needs to be immediately apparent. Results must be obvious to the person who made the decision, and the person must believe that their actions are the cause of the variations and outcomes. And finally, the presence of a teacher or someone who knows how to do something, who can explain the correct action or the correct answer to take. All of that facilitates human learning. Unfortunately, ideology lacks all of this. Societies as a whole suffer from bad ideologies, not just the individuals who believe in them. There are so many factors that create changes in, for example, crime or inequality or pollution that it makes it very difficult to identify what the actual results of policy are. Humans rarely get immediate feedback on the results of their ideology in the real world. Governments often take a long time to implement policies, and those policies are never exactly what the individual wants. So it's very easy for the ideology to come up with excuses for why there were bad results. It's because the government didn't do exactly the right thing. If they only had done something a little different, then things would be much better. So it makes it very difficult for people to realize that their ideologies are incorrect. Ideologies typically teach that individual actions do not matter. And there are no teachers of ideology. There are only propagandists. So for all of these reasons, it's very difficult for System 2 to take over when it comes to ideologies because individuals are not actually impacted by the results of their thinking in a very obvious way. Ideology is System 1 thinking. Ideologies focus on intentions, not results. Ideologies give individuals psychological benefits regardless of the consequences of policy to others. So this means people can oftentimes stick to an ideology even after it's obvious to everyone else that it doesn't work. But it's important to point out that ideology is not 100% System 1 thinking. There's also a dash of System 2 thinking. So there is still hope.
to understand a little bit more deeply about how the psychology works, I want to introduce another book from psychology, The Righteous Mind, Why, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion by Jonathan Haidt. Jonathan Haidt is one of the best and most respected social psychologists, and he particularly focuses on the role of ideology and religion in human psychology. So I'm going to paraphrase some of the findings from his book. The human mind is based on moral reasoning, not rationality. We perceive our own thinking as based upon rationality, but we perceive people with differing views as being irrational. Does that sound like ideology? Yeah, I think so. Western philosophy and intelligent people have been worshipping reason and distrusting passions for thousands of years. They are incorrect. Rationality usually cannot override passions. And it's interesting that David Hume and much of the Scottish Enlightenment came to very much the same conclusions in opposition to the French Enlightenment, which believed that rationality should conquer all. This rationality delusion has an implicit assumption that philosophers and scientists should have more power. It usually comes with a utopian program. In other words, there are certain people who know better than others. Give them power and they will solve our problems. How convenient. Intuitions come first, and reasoning is usually produced after a judgment is made in order to influence other people. Intelligent people are not more rational. I want to emphasize that point because a lot of people think intelligent people are more rational than other intelligent, than less intelligent people. It's not true. They are just better at arguing that their side is correct. They are no better than others at understanding the other side and questioning their own assumptions. Our brain is like an elephant and a rider. The elephant is our intuition or the system one thinking, and the rider is system two or the conscious reasoning. Now, you might think that the rider is in control, but no, that's not true. Jonathan Haidt believes that the elephant is in control, while the rider functions as a press secretary whose job it is to invent rational arguments to justify the elephant's actions. And that's important. Rationality is involved in ideology, but it's not the cause of ideology. Rationality helps to convince other people, but it doesn't cause the ideology in the first place. Our morality blinds us as groups, but it blinds us as to why we believe what we do. We think that our beliefs are based upon rationality when they are actually based upon projecting an image of morality to others. Because of this, you cannot convince someone with a different ideology or religion with facts. That is like trying to make a dog happy by forcibly wagging its tail. Humans are moral animals. We all want to believe that we are immoral. More importantly, we want others to believe that we are moral so that we are accepted by a larger group. And I think this is one of the most important findings from Jonathan Haidt that, that really helped to explain ideology and how it works in the human brain. Religion and ideology are the primary means through which we enable others to believe that we are moral. This is why these value systems are so important to people. Because common moral values pull a group together, humans evolved moral reasoning to enable cooperation within groups that are competing with other groups to survive. Rationality did not evolve to help us find truth, but to help persuade others. We are all self-righteous hypocrites. Ouch, that one hurts. We are terrible at seeing errors in our own reasoning, but we are good at spotting weaknesses in other people's reasoning. We need others to point out our errors, but discussion can degenerate to people pointing out facts to each other and both parties getting increasingly angry over the perceived irrationality of the other party. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, I think it does. When discussions are hostile, the odds of change are slight. The elephant leans away from the opponent and the rider works frantically to rebut the opponent's charges. Everything that's said so far, I agree almost 100% with. Where I diverge a little bit is in Jonathan Haidt's own theory, which he calls moral foundations theory. He believes that political ideologies are based upon five, or, he, or later he adds in a sixth foundation. Those are care, harm, fairness versus cheating, loyalty versus betrayal, authority versus subversion, sanctity versus degradation, and liberty versus oppression. 
he essentially believes that everybody has certain beliefs along these five or six dimensions. And that will explain their ideology. Liberals believe strongly in care and fairness, but are far less interested in liberty, loyalty, authority, and sanctity. Libertarians believe strongly in liberty, but are far less interested in the other five foundations. Conservatives care roughly equal in all six. So no, I don't doubt that that's true, but it kind of assumes that people are using moral reasoning of, tr of thinking through care and fairness and liberty and loyalty and authority and sanctity, and then deciding what their ideology is. I believe that our personal dimensions, which are primarily coming from genetics, determine how much we care about care and fairness and such. So it's not moral reasoning. It's we are rationalizing what our genes tell us to believe. So let's put this all together. My view is that Kahneman and Haidt are largely correct, but we need to add in more. My view is based on the following five things. One is there's a strong genetic component to ideology. Two, it's primarily driven by non-rational psychology, as Kahneman and Haidt stated, and that much of ideology is actually public relations about trying to convince other people of how rational you are, not actually making decisions based on rationality, which is what Haidt says. We also need to cooperate within the group, and we form social identities. So if you put all those together, I think you have a plausible a hypothesis for where ideologies come from. One, voters choose between ideologies based upon their underlying psychological temperament. That temperament is largely determined by genetics, but parenting, culture, and life experiences also play a role. A person's chosen ideology must also be plausible to the rational part of their brain and their culture and social networks, in other words, their parents, their family, their co-workers and such. That ideology must project an image that a person wants to project to others. So a big part of deciding what ideology you want is deciding what image you want to project to other people. Individuals try to rationalize their ideological preferences to others. This rationalization is not the cause of why they chose that ideology. It's the public relations of trying to convince other people about why you believe in that ideology and why they should too. People like to associate with others who have similar identity, so there is a strong social element as well. This tends to reinforce their ideological choice. Many people also do not like to associate with others who can make logical arguments why their ideology is incorrect. Because people don't want to be confronted with the fact that their ideology is not based on rationality. It's based on psychological impulses. So people tend to self-sort. And in a world of social media and the internet, it's very, very easy to interact only with people who agree with you and avoid people who have a different opinion. And in totalitarian societies, they even censor, punish, or even kill people of different opinions. Why? Because they don't want it to be found out that their whole value system is based on non-rational psychological impulses, which are no better than the impulses from other people. Over time, that ideology becomes part of a person's identity, so it is very hard to change. Not impossible, but very hard. This identity is essential for cooperating within groups, but if the ideology is too far off from objective reality, then it leads the group to self-destruction. Now I'm going to follow up on this last point in much more detail in my next video. Well, I hope you like this video. Please subscribe and like. It really helps this channel grow. Also, I'd appreciate any comments so that I know what it is you like and what it is you dislike about this episode and other episodes on the channel. If you'd like more resources on the topic of progress, I'd recommend going to my website, frompovertytoprogress.com. With a free email subscription, you get free ebook samples, free audio samples, and discounted prices on ebooks and audiobooks.
If you insist on paying full price, you can buy my books in the eback, paperback, and hardcover format at Amazon and Ingram Spark if you're a bookstore or a library. Audiobooks are available at Amazon, Audible, and iTunes. If you're interested in book summaries on the concepts of technology, history, economic growth, and progress, I would recommend going to my other website, which is techratchet.com. I've got over 280 book summaries there, and many of them I will be covering in future episodes in this channel. So please tell me which one you're most interested in covering. So now we've gotten to the exciting part. It's a free book giveaway. I'm giving away a digital copy of my first book, From Poverty to Progress. Most of you already know the rules. If you don't know the rules, please pause this video and read the instructions. I hope you enjoy this video and that you explore more episodes on this channel. See you next time!